Well, good morning, church. It is so good morning. Who said that? Somebody is happy to be here. I'm so glad. It's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Our God, He is great and mighty and powerful. That's on the orchestra just play that He is mighty to save. He is mighty to save us from our sin and from all of our transgressions. I'm so glad you're here. Let's all stand together. Psalm 145, one through three says this, I will extol you, or that is mightily praise my God and King. I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. This is our mighty God. Let's worship him together. Every voice, church, let's sing this. Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship in one accord. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Sing hallelujah to our God. Glory hallelujah is to our God. Every praise. this morning church family how are y'all oh it's summertime you can hear it how are y'all good we're so incredibly glad that you are here with us whether you're on campus or even online we just want to say good morning and welcome to worship my name is AJ Keats and I am the active families pastor here at Carville First Baptist Church and we just want to kind of let you know of some things on the front end number one if you are new here, we are so glad you are with us today. In fact, you will find in the seat backs in front of you a card. 
on that card, you're going to have one side that's all about connection. It's all about how we maybe can uh, minister to you better. And so if you feel comfortable, just include some information on that card so we can reach out to you. Drop it into the offering boxes on your way out at the end of the service. We would love to talk with you all. Also, on the other side of that card is a spot where you can write down any prayer requests that you have. And as a staff, we pray every Monday, and we have a bunch of prayer warriors here at our church, so you will be prayed for. So please use that in any way you see fit. Also, we love to celebrate some stuff here at this church. I hope that you guys like to celebrate. In fact, we love celebrating faithful marriages, and we've got three to celebrate this morning. Are y'all ready for those? We've got a couple right here, here we go. So TC and Judy Hasty are celebrating 52 years today. Amen, I'm not sure where they might be here. Down, yeah, that's right, that's right, I see them over there, I see them over there, okay. But we're not done. We also have Mr. Jack and Miss Betty only celebrating 62 years of marriage. Amen, amen. And finally, we also have Daryl and Ann Guyman celebrating 62 years of marriage as well. Give it up for them. We just want to say thank you so much for everything you do to exemplify uh, faithfulness in your marriage and prayer uh, and help for our church. We love you guys. And so there you go. Hey, but also we've got some other things we want to celebrate. Number one, I'm sure you saw some videos on screen as you were coming in today. And I'm wearing a different type of shirt because we had two not one, but two summer camps this past week. First up, we had kids camp. So if you went to kids camp, let me hear you. Are you in this room right now? Yeah, we took 75 people, 61 kids, and check this out. Pastor Justin, who is unfortunately unable to be here this morning, he wanted to make sure that y'all heard, church family, that eight kids accepted Christ as our Lord and Savior. That's right. That is amazing. But we also had student camp. And so if you went to student camp, let me hear y'all this morning. Yes. So we had an incredible week. We took 135 with us and we had six place faith in Jesus Christ. That's right. So in total, that means we have 14 new brothers and sisters in Christ, and we're so excited to be celebrating those. So be looking for them as we continue with, with baptisms in the weeks to come as we follow up with them. But we just wanted to extend that heartfelt welcome, and we're so excited that you're here. And hey, it was a great week, but it's not over yet. Pastor Joshua. Amen. Give the Lord a hand for what he's done in our kids' and students' lives this morning. Hallelujah. The songs we're singing today, we hear a lot from the book of Psalms. We just started a new sermon series just a couple of weeks ago from the book of Psalms. And so you're going to see some different passages from Psalm 145 this morning. I opened up with one, and this next one here ties into this next song, 17 and 18. It says this, The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The Lord is righteous in all of his ways and kind in all of his works. He's near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. This is the word of the Lord. Let's all stand together as we worship him.
with us. Let's sing this next verse. I will sing of my Redeemer. Lifted me from disaster Set my feet a solid rock to stand There is help for the hopeless For the wounded in me Cause in the presence of Jesus There is power in every way. Next we read in verse 13 of 145, your kingdom, O Lord, is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord Yahweh, he is faithful in all of his words and he is kind in all of his works. Great is thy faithfulness, O Beautiful church. Thou changest not thy compassion, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness. 
Sing it out. Great is thy faithfulness. We declare morning by morning, new mercy I see. All I have need in thy hands hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Strength for today. 
find out before too long How quickly blue skies can grow dark And gentle winds blow strong Suddenly fear is like white water Pounding on the soul But still we sail on knowing That our Lord is in control Sometimes He calms the storm With a whispered peace be still he can set up any sea, but it doesn't mean He will. Sometimes He holds us close, lest the winds and waves grow wild. Sometimes He calms the storm, but other times He calms His child. that we pass through in life And though we're shaken we cannot be pulled apart from Christ No matter how the driving rain beats down on those who hold the faith A heart of trust will always Thank you, Ernie, choir and orchestra. The events of this week have reminded me of this passage I want to share with you. Psalms 126, verses 2 and 3. Then our mouth was filled with laughter, and our tongue with joyful shouting. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are glad. For 50 years, we have wanted to read this headline, Roe v. Wade Overturned. Many of us have prayed for that, faithfully. Many of us have worked towards that. But I want to remind you, it's not what we have done. It's because of the one we have come to worship. God is in charge. God is sovereign. And it reminds me of some other passages I want to share with you. Proverbs 21.1 says, The king's heart, or justices, are like channels of water in the hands of the Lord. He turns it wherever he wishes. 
Psalm 129, 4 says, The Lord is righteous. He is the one who cuts the cords of the wicked. He is the one who has worked. And that's why we have come today to praise him, to turn to him. So let's go right now in prayer. Father, we praise you because you are sovereign. You are almighty. You are all powerful. You are all knowing. You are ever present. You are merciful. And Lord, we are just in awe of who you are. And Lord, we praise you today because of the things you have done. You have worked in our lives to provide us many good things. But today, Lord, we want to praise you because you have worked within our nation to resolve at this moment an issue that I know grieves you. Lord, we pray for forgiveness for the over 60 million children who have been aborted. Lord, we confess that sin and ask you to forgive us. But Lord, we thank you that you continue to work, that you work in the heart of justices, Alito, Thomas, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Coney Barrett. We thank you, Lord, that you have used them to bring about this decision. And right now we pray for their protection. Lord, we thank you for the leaders who put them in place, that you use them for your glory. But Lord, the work is not done. The work continues because you need to empower us, your church, to continue to be a lighthouse with a message that every life counts from the one that is conceived to the one that's on the deathbed. Every life counts. And Lord, we need your discernment for direction as a church, a local church, and the great church about how we can continue to be used by you to say that every life matters, that every person matters, that life is precious. But also, Lord, We need you to empower us through your Holy Spirit to say that life is nothing without Jesus. That life is not truly complete until someone comes to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. Lord, there may be someone in this room today who does not know Jesus as their King, Jesus as their Savior, you as their Father. So Lord, I pray right now as your word is opened up that the gospel will be preach and it will be made clear that we are nothing without you that we are incomplete and Lord as you have worked in the life of our nation I pray that you'll work in the life of some individuals for Cliff Walker for Mary Beth Acock for Jeannie Wood and Dot Lott Lord I pray that you would heal their bodies and strengthen them for Gail Latham Carter and Randy Brown who are in hospice I pray Lord that you would Be with them in these days. Be with their families. Give them strength. And for Alice Winburn and Barbara Rayburn, who are having surgeries this week, guide the hands of doctors and nurses, but Lord, you are the great physician, so we pray that you'll work. And be with Lester Ritchie in the death of his wife. Lord, bring him comfort and peace. And right now, Lord, I pray for your saints that are gathered in this room, that we will pay attention to your word. And I pray for Dr. Danny Singfield, who is coming to deliver your message, that you would anoint him. And I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. It's my privilege to introduce you today, someone I've known for several years, Dr. Danny Singfield. He's a product of two of our seminaries. He's uh, served, just retired recently, January 1st, I believe, from Faith Baptist. He was their pastor for 27 years. He was their only full-time pastor they ever had. He came 15 months after the church started, I believe. And he has been faithful. He has a new job now, a job that fits his personality. Let me just tell you one thing about Danny Singfield. He is an encourager. If you wanted to see what Barnabas looked like, well, he's a modern-day Barnabas. And he actually has that kind of job. He works for the Tennessee Baptist Convention, and he works with 500 pastors in West Tennessee, encouraging and training them. His title is Harvest Field Team Leader. But it is my privilege to bring him up here. He has Rhonda, his wife with him, Rhonda Nichols Singfield, uh, and their grandson, Jeremiah. They have seven grandchildren. But Brother Danny, it's my honor to introduce you to my family. These are godly people. 
they love the Lord, they love their pastor, and they love the word. And so let's dive in. Amen. Thank you, Brother Sam. Church family, good morning, and I would ask you to open your Bibles with me to Psalm 19. While you're turning there, let me say what a great privilege it is to be at the Kyreville First Baptist Church, sharing from the pulpit of my good friend, Dr. Chuck Herring. I love your pastor so much, but we especially love Miss Darlene. Rhonda and Darlene are good friends, and hasn't the Lord been good to us in taking good care of that young lady? We're so grateful. But we're, we're honored to be here today. I do want to bring you greetings on behalf of our network of churches across the state. You may know this, that we have roughly 3,000 churches in the Tennessee Baptist Network, Tennessee Baptist Mission Board or Convention. And uh, those churches are from over here in West Tennessee all the way up to the beautiful northeast side of our state, 3,000 churches strong. Our executive director and president, Dr. Randy Davis, would want me to say thank you to Kyreville First Baptist. Out of those 3,000 churches across our state, um, we're bound together by our commitment to the gospel and missions and sharing together uh, the good news of Christ uh, across our state, across our nation and around the world. One of the ways that we do that is through our collective giving uh, that you know here as uh, something we call the cooperative program and then other missions giving. You may or may not know this, that Kyreville First Baptist Church is in uh, every year, but even this past year, you're in the top 10 of the most gracious, generous giving churches. Remember I said 3,000? I don't mean 10%. You're in the top 10 in giving through the cooperative program, and I just want to say thank you for your partnership. Uh, Every year, every year at Faith Baptist that we served there for almost three decades, I would always watch whatever Kyreville First Baptist was doing, and I would try to catch up. Man, it's hard to keep up with Kyreville First Baptist. Dr. Chuck Herring uh, Sutton certainly is um, a dear friend of mine. He and I have been in a prayer group for the past two years every Tuesday afternoon. There's a small group of us that meet together, and uh, we pray for our churches, we pray for uh, our city, uh, the greater metro Memphis area, and we pray for one another, and it's been my privilege to uh, just grow to love him more and uh, to be a part of that prayer ministry, prayer group together, and so what what a privilege to be here today. I have many um, friends and uh, some folks that we've known from through the years that are members here at Kyreville First Baptist. I, uh, I have some who've made more of a lasting impression than others. I'll, I'll explain that. My good friend Andy Bramlett is here today. I've already spoken with him. I first met Andy on the football field our senior year of high school. Uh, he was playing for another team, and I was playing for the good team. And I met Andy uh, that night on the opening kickoff. I was on the kickoff team. He was on the kickoff return team. And I just want you to know that I still have that lasting impression of his face mask in my chest to this day. That's been a long time ago. Uh, but we love you. Thank God for the blessings of uh, the ministries, the vast ministries, the great mission heartbeat that you have here at Kyreville First Baptist. Let me also say that as I have had the privilege now in traveling uh, in different churches um, uh, these last six months, and I've been doing it terribly long, we don't get out much, but it's just such a great privilege to be in different pulpits, different churches, meet church families. Um, One of the things that I'd want to do today, I don't know what your polity is, and I didn't even ask permission to do this from Pastor Chuck. I'll ask forgiveness. Um, My wife, Rhonda, and I would like to become honorary members of Kyreville First Baptist Church. If I can get a second. All in favor, say aye, clap, whatever. And certainly there are none opposed. So we're honorary members (laughs) of Kyreville First Baptist. So what that means is, do you guys still pass out offering envelopes? I'll be looking for my offering envelopes in the mail sometime. But I know they'll, they'll be arriving soon. But we're so thrilled and thankful to be a part of what God's doing here uh, at this wonderful church. And so thank you for your prayers for us. As, as Brother Sam mentioned a moment ago, as we, as we do travel, I have 527 churches in 15 counties of West Tennessee. And those pastors, many of them small rural congregations, many of them bivocational guys. Um, and to have the privilege to get to speak in some of those pulpits is, is just a great honor. And here's what I've noticed as I've traveled. God has his hand of blessing upon churches, especially where where the pastor loves his people and where the people love their pastor and the staff. And I just want to say, of all the churches that I'm around in this side of the state, I don't know of any church where their pastor loves their people more than your pastor loves you. 
And so thank you for being good to them. All the staff guys, you have an incredible team of ministry men and ladies here. And um, what, a, what, a, what a joy to be with you today. I'm going to invite you to stand as we read God's word together. Psalm 19, uh, just the first uh, 11 verses here. As um, I am joining in on the study in Psalms, this series on the Psalms during the summer season. And uh, the scripture says here, this is a Psalm of David, beginning in verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God. And the firmament, that's the vast expanse of the heavens, the, fa- the vast expanse of the skies, shows his handiwork. Day unto day utter speech, night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming out of this chamber and rejoices like a strong man to run its race. It, it, its rising is from one end to the, of heaven and its circuit to the other end. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgment of the Lord, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey, and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Let's pray together again. Father, bless this time around your word. Lord, thank you. For ears that hear and hearts that embrace, and Lord, for lives that are willing to put into practice the teachings of your text today, God, I pray that you would meet with us, and I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to respond in any way that you call us today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. While you're being seated, let me just uh, share with you a couple of thoughts. First of all, I'm sharing a message that I've simply called Hearing God's Voice, Hearing God's Voice. You know, I've always been impressed with people who can speak more than one language fluently. Does that that amaze you? When I hear somebody, you know, started rambling on another language, it's like, goodness gracious, how how does a person get to do that? I mean, I've got a little bit of Mexican restaurant Spanish. Can I get a witness from somebody? Amen. And, you know, we've traveled around, done some mission work, so I've got a few phrases of, you know, uh, Portuguese. And, and uh, here's what I've noticed. Even when you can't speak the language very well, the folks uh, in whatever culture or country you're trying to speak, they're always grateful for your attempt. They laugh at you, but they're grateful for the, for the attempt. The Bible says that God speaks to us, listen to this, in every language. Amen. Hallelujah. I, I love this text so much when, when uh, Brother Chuck and I were having lunch together not long ago here in town. Uh, he was telling me about this series. He said, you don't have to, but if you want to, just pick out your favorite psalm. And so uh, I actually picked out Psalm 1, but he said, no, that's mine, last Sunday, so I get it. <laughs> I, I yielded to the pastor, right? And so I, I said, what about Psalm 19? And I, I just want to ask you this question today around this text. How can we hear God's voice? And this passage reminds us that God is speaking to us in many ways and in multiple levels all the time. The problem is not the speaking or the voice of God, but the problem is on the, 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 the hearer's part, the listening of our ears sometimes. Uh, let, let's just look at what King David says here about the variety of ways that we can hear God's voice. And the very first way that we are reminded of how to hear God's voice is simply, as he has put it, the clear voice of God in the skies. When he he talks about creation, uh, listen to it again uh, there in in verse number 19, verse 1, the heavens declare, there's this declaration, there's this proclamation, there's this voice sounding out from the heavens, the voice of God, and the clear voice shows up in in his handiwork, the skies, the the, the firmament is called it. I want you to notice two or three things about this particular way that God speaks to us, how he speaks to us through creation or through the skies. First of all, that is an undeniable message. Listen to what it says again. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament, the vast expanse shows his handiwork. Here's here's what I want you to take away from that. When you see something as beautiful as the creation of the world or the creation of the universe for that matter, it absolutely screams the message that there is a creator. 
When you see something of such beautiful design and such uh, incredible um, intricacy and extravagance and, and uh, the beauty of all that we behold, when you see that design, it, it screams out loudly the message, there is a designer who put it all together. Whenever there's a creation, there must be a creator. Whenever there's design, there must be a designer. Um, recently, we were joining together with other Southern Baptists for our convention, our annual meeting over in Anaheim, California. By the way, a very pu- beautiful part of our country. Southern California, I would take the temperature every day here in the summer. Amen. Brother Chuck and I, we, we got to see each other there as well. And, and uh, Rhonda and I decided that we were going to practice something that's kind of new for us. Rather than renting a car in uh, Los Angeles and try to drive in that crazy traffic, we decided we were going to become Uber champs. You know what an Uber is? Can I, somebody, yep, so I've got the app on my phone, we called up the Uber, it arrived safely, and the very first ride that we caught from the airport over to the convention center hotel was a young man who was driving a brand new, very expensive, very nice Tesla. And I mean, it was, it was, it was a good ride. I mean, we, had a, we had a great time. And, and so I just said to the young guy driving, I said, man, this is a nice car. And, and from the moment I said that till the time we ended up at our hotel, he was telling us all the features about this wonderful car. He said, e- this car even drives itself. And I said, well, don't do that. You just, keep, you just keep your hands on the wheel. And he was telling us about the engine and how fast it was and all these technical things. And, 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 and I was just thinking about that moment. Um, what if that young man driving that Tesla had told us, you know, it was an amazing thing. There was a tornado that came through town here and it hit a, it hit a junkyard. And out of, that, out of that tornado's terrific, you know, tearing up that junkyard, this Tesla showed up on my front porch, on my front doorstep. Well, we would have thought, the thing that you're thinking, that's nonsense, that's, that's crazy, and yet we, we live in a world where people say such foolish things. The Big Bang. You know, I, I, I believe the Bible. I believe that, um, that the Scripture says that God created the heavens and the earth. He spoke, and there was a Big Bang, and everything was you know, formed together according to his design. Amen. That's the Big Bang. When God speaks, there's a Big Bang that goes on. In fact, Psalm 14.1 says, The fool has said in his heart, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Only a fool would believe something of that kind of a story of of, uh, just circumstance and chaos that comes beautiful creation. Not only is it an undeniable message, it is an unchanging message. Listen to verse 2. Day unto day, every single day, the creation speaks. It utters speech, and night unto night, it reveals knowledge. King David would say this in another beautiful psalm, Psalm chapter 8. I love this, these verses, verses 1 through, uh, ver, ver, verse 1, and then verses 3 through 4. Listen to it. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who have set your glory above the heavens. And then David would say this, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, then, then he asked the question, what is man? He, he, he would say it like this, who am I that you would even know my name, that you would even acknowledge me? What is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you visited him? Can I just say to you today, every once in a while, in our very busy and crazy world with, uh, you know, seven going on eight billion people on this planet, Every once in a while, we can feel a little intimidated by the vastness of it all. But I just want to remind you today, somebody needs to hear this. God in heaven who created the heavens and the earth, he knows your name. And he knows what you need today. He knows where you are. He knows what's going on in your life. And not only does he know your name and does he know all about us, but he cares deeply for you. The the, the fact that God who created everything looks down and loves you individually, loves us Loves us his, as the crown of his creation. I just wanted to remind you of that today. Back when I was growing up as a, as a young boy, one of my favorite places to go and favorite uh, times of the year was in the summertime. We had the privilege to spend um, some vacation down on the farm with my grandparents. My, my dad's mom and dad, Papa Sinkfield, Papa and Mama Sinkfield, lived down in the Mississippi Delta. They lived in Tallahatchie County. He was a cotton farmer and had a wonderful spread of land. Right across the street was the Tallahatchie River. It was a mecca for boys to get into trouble. Amen. We just had so much fun. The big barn to climb up in the loft. and it just, we, we just had a wonderful time do you know if you ever been down to the delta or some parts of our country that are rural when the when the sun goes down in the delta brothers it gets dark serious dark amen 
I mean, there are no city lights. There's no street lights. I mean, I don't even think they have, uh, you know, lightning bugs down there. It's just, it's just dark, dark. And, and so Papa Singfield, the, the, the ritual was that we would get in the bed and he would come into the bedroom, some of my cousins and I, my brothers and I, and uh, he, he, would, uh, he would bring this thing, uh, a spray can with a, with a lever on it. And I believe that I saw on that lever, he said, boys, cover up for a moment, cover up for a moment. But there was a skull and crossbones on that thing that he was, mosquito spray, right? You know what that was? That's why we have respiratory issues to this day. But when, listen, when he turned off the light, brothers, you better, you better know where you are because it got really, really dark. And every once in a while, we would sneak out on the front porch or we would, we would um, look up into the heavens out the window. And you know when it's dark out in the country like that, you can just see forever. And, and the stars and the beauty of it all, the vastness of God's creation, it, it just simply reminds us. And every once in a while in that, that old Mississippi Delta, every once in a while the storms would come rolling through. I mean, uh, even in the daytime, the afternoon, the, uh, the skies would get dark and the lightning would start to, you know, to crackle and, and the thunder would begin to roll. And uh, we, always, we always kind of were worried about when storms came because my, my, my Papa Singfield, he was scared to death of a storm. Uh, the, the old barn was about halfway, you know, decimated by a tornado that came through years ago, decades earlier. And uh, he built a storm house, a storm shelter uh, down behind uh, another barn and down in the dirt. We used to play in there as little boys. And it was, a, it was a scary place, spiders, snakes, all that stuff. But it didn't matter if it was 3 o'clock in the morning. If the storm came, Papa Sinkfield was getting you up and you were going to the storm shelter. Amen. Can I get a witness from somebody? I got close to Jesus down in that storm shelter on more than, on more than one occasion. It reminds me of the song. Remember it? The song by the title of How Great Thou Art, O Lord My God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed, then sings my soul. Does your, has, has your soul been singing lately of how great, how majestic, how wonderful, how vast? So, so the un deniable message the unchanging message you notice it's a it's a universal message the voice of God from the skies in verses three and four there is no speech or language anywhere where their voice is not heard their line has gone out through all the earth and so no person on the planet no person in history past or in the in the future can ever say quote I have never heard God's voice because creation alone is a clear witness Creation alone is a clear witness. Let me remind you of a, a, a very important New Testament text, Romans chapter 1. If you're turning in your Bibles or opening it up there in your, in your, uh, uh, with your uh, device, listen to this. Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse number 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Somebody asked the question from time to time, yeah, but what about those innocent people out there on the island that have never heard. You know, we do believe in sending missionaries with the good news of the gospel everywhere, and especially among those people groups that do not have a, a gospel witness or a printed scripture in their own language. But can I just say as a reminder of what the text teaches us, what the Bible uh, teaches us, there is no such thing as an innocent person on any island. The Bible says there is none righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I'm reminded today that the Bible has been very clear that God has given them a witness of creation. And what's happened, what happened in the book of Romans is happening today, that men have rejected him and refused to trust in him. And I just remind you that all have sinned, and Jesus would say that they are already condemned. I didn't come to condemn the world, John chapter 3, but the world is already condemned. I want you to notice not only the clear voice of God in the skies. Notice, secondly, the consistent voice of God. 
in the scriptures. Verses seven through nine in this psalm um, is a rehearsal of the, of the beauty and the bounty that is ours, uh, the consistent voice of God in the scripture. In, in these three verses, seven, eight, nine, there are three sets of poetic Hebrew phrases that are used, and they read like a song. In fact, when Rhonda and I were doing student ministry down in uh, Mississippi and then later in, in Central Florida, um, I used to play the guitar and sing, and, and our little group with uh, college students would meet in our home, and we would sing these verses. Um, it, 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 just a beautiful, beautiful, catchy uh, little melody that goes with them. But, but, but listen to them again. And, and just, just, just be reminded of, of these three phrases and their couplets. They, um, the, the first two are found in verse 7. Uh, the, about God's word, it says, it is perfect and it restores us. God's word is perfect and it restores us. Uh, that's what the language means. It converts the soul. It changes and transforms. It refreshes and heals us. Can I just say something? God's word changes people's lives it has in the past it will in the future it does today not only that but the scripture says it is sure in its testimony and it makes us wise if you want to be a a bright person a brilliant person then you hide God's word in your heart you know what God's word says you follow the teaching the clear truth of God's word and and uh, the Bible says that you will become a wise person the second couplet of this Hebrew poetry it says uh, God's word is right and it causes us to rejoice it will never take us down the wrong path if you will follow God's word you're going to get home safely it's going to lead you in the right ways and the right places. The second part of that phrase, it is pure and it enlightens us. It is undiluted, unpolluted from worldly philosophies. And by the way, um, thank the Lord, and your, your pastor has been on the front lines of uh, helping to encourage this, um, to, to not only be reminded that the scripture um, is true and trustworthy, that it is infallible and inspired by the, by the, by the hand of God, the spirit of God, but also the, the gospel the gospel, the good news of Jesus, is sufficient for everything that we need. We don't need to add any other worldly philosophy, the Bible and something else. The Bible is sufficient. It deals with all of our issues in life and practice. It helps us to love one another. It helps us to love all people. It helps us to treat people the way that they ought to be treated. It, it, it helps us to understand uh, what are the important issues in life, the great commandments, to love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, body, strength, and to love God, uh, and you know, to, to love God with all of your heart, mind, body, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. That's the great commandments, and the great commission to to make disciples as we go into all the world, to share the good news of the gospel with everybody, everywhere, all the time. This is, this is the, these are the, uh, the consistent voice of God in the scriptures. And then the verse 9, it brings respect and reverence, and it, is all, and it always endures. This fear of the Lord, it never fails, never fades. It finishes there by saying it is true and always trustworthy. You can trust it, you can live it, and I know that you love it. God's word is consistent in its content and in its character. A couple of the key verses around uh, to, to just kind of remind you of something that you already know. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, I love this, and I know you've heard these verses plenty of times here at Cairo First Baptist. Listen to it again. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Listen to this. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Can I say one thing? Just as a deep appreciation of mine for your pastor, your, pra your pastor loves God's Word. You can't be around very, very long with Brother Chuck, but he's not talking about preaching. I mean, he loves to preach. He loves, he loves you. He loves this church. He is a preacher of the, of the gospel. He is a Bible preacher and teacher. And what a, what a blessing you have to, to have a shepherd that, that opens up his Bible every week. And, and I'm reminded from time to time that there are churches or so-called churches around, they never hear their pastor say, open your Bible. They hear a story. They, they have a, a couple of, you know, uh, insightful illustrations, and maybe they close with a verse of Scripture, but your, your, your pastor does it right. He teaches every, every week 
all the time, directly from the truth of God's word. And, and never take that for granted. You always, all, always ought to say thank you, God, for our pastor who loves your word. I want you to notice the third theme that comes out here. Not only the clear voice of God from the skies and the consistent voice of God from the scriptures, but notice the convicting voice of God in the soul. The Bible speaks not just to the mind of a man or to the emotions, but it speaks much deeper than that. It carries down into the depths of our soul. So that King David would say after, after making these statements in, in Psalm chapter 19, he would, he would sing out as if it were the, uh, the chorus of this great, great song that he's been singing here uh, in verses 10 and 11. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. These two verses speak of the power of God's word to change the desires of our hearts and minds and lives. And it speaks of God's word to have the power to change the decisions that we make. Notice these three things, uh, three or four things that uh, the scripture here mentions. First of all, God's word enriches us. God's word brings value to us. He says it's worth more than gold and much fine gold. It speaks of the, 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 the spiritual profit of the word of God. But, but then it also talks about the spiritual pleasure. Listen to it. God's word not only enriches us, but God's word satisfies us. I'm telling you that the word of God, the promises of God, the truth of God through his word is sweeter than honey and the honeycomb. You know, as we get... Uh, older and further along in our faith. One of the things that we, that we recognize is that God's word is such a, such a beautiful, sweet gift. Don't you, don't you love to hear the scripture? Don't you love to read the scripture? Don't you love to sing the scripture? It, it, it's that which enriches us and satisfies us, but also the Bible says that God's word warns us. By them is thy servant warned. It, it, it brings correction and clear direction to our lives. It, it's, a, it's a blinking yellow and sometimes a blinking red light that, that brings uh, a wealth of, of wisdom because of the warning of God's word. And then the Bible says that God's word rewards us. I mean, it, there, there, are some, there are some great gifts that come. In keeping of them, there is great reward. The writer James said it like this. Hey, listen, it's not enough. It's never enough just to be a hearer of the word. What do you got to do? Well, you have, to, you have to be a doer of the word. Jesus, master teacher, master illustrator, the close of the great Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, gave this illustration and I believe this word of warning. Here, here's what he said. The wise man is one who not only hears my word, but does what I say. He is like a man who built his house on the rock. He dug deep, he worked hard, he laid a foundation, and he, and he put his house solid on the rock. It's a wise man. But the foolish man is one who hears my word, but doesn't do what I say. He is like the, the man who built his house on the sand. And you know the story. And Jesus in this illustration said there's a storm that came. The rains fell, the winds blew, the floods came up, and uh, the foolish man's house was completely and utterly destroyed. Brothers and sisters, I want to say to you, there's no greater foundation than the hearing and the doing of God's word. It's one thing to hear, it's another thing to do. Let's do both, amen. And so we see here the, convinced, the convicting voice of God down in the depths of our soul. And then last, I just want to remind you of something I've simply called the compelling voice of God in the Savior. I believe the whole Bible is about Jesus. Do you believe that? The whole Bible is about Jesus. Uh, I want to read this New Testament uh, passage you know well. John, the writer in, in his gospel, uh, said something uh, about Jesus that's very distinct and very unique, unlike Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, Matthew and Luke, of course, who, who dealt with a birth narrative and Jesus' birth was this way. Matthew and Luke. And then John just, uh, rather Mark, just picks up right in the middle of his ministry, came preaching and teaching and healing. But John goes way back. And you know this. Listen to it in John chapter 1. In the beginning, he does pretty far back. In the beginning was the Word, the Logos. And the Word was with God, and the Word 
was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Down in verse 14, listen to this. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. I want to remind you that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's what John, the writer, said. Uh, Sometimes the uh, the Pharisees or others uh, who were hearing Jesus teach, they would say, show us the Father. And, And Jesus would say, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus is God who wrapped himself in the human flesh and he lived with us for a while. He tabernacled. He dwelt among us. He, he lived a sinless, perfect life. He died for our sins. He was buried in a borrowed tomb. He rose again. And brothers and sisters, Jesus is coming again. I mean, the story is continuing on. And so we're reminded uh, of what Jesus said to the Pharisees when, when, they were, uh, when they were confronting him about his authority. In John chapter 5 and verse 39, he would say this, you search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life, but these are they which testify of me. Now, when he was talking about searching the scriptures, what scriptures was he, what did he have in mind? He had the Old Testament in mind. He had the law and the prophets, basically, is what they were, what they were looking into, and the history of, of Israel. These scriptures that you're searching, if you look hard enough, deep enough, you're going to see me there. Jesus is the subject matter, the primary character, the primary theme of all the Bible. In fact, uh, listen to Jesus' own words when he said it on the road to Emmaus. Remember that? Luke chapter 24 and verse 27. Those uh, unsuspecting, grieving disciples, they, they, they were walking away from all that had happened in Jerusalem and they they found this, uh, they thought it was a stranger. But the scripture says, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And I want to say it one more time. Brothers and sisters, the whole Bible is about Jesus. Don't miss Jesus in Genesis. Don't miss Jesus when the father confronted Adam and Eve and, and because of their guilt, the innocent died for the guilty. I, w- I don't want you to miss the, uh, the picture of Jesus in Genesis chapter 22 when Abram and Isaac went up to the mountain and, and there was a substitute for the son there at Mount Moriah. And on and on, Exodus chapter 12 at the Passover, we could go on and on. The whole Bible is about Jesus. Uh, in fact, in Acts chapter 8, one of my favorite confrontations of gospel evangelism, um, the Spirit moved Stephen, remember that? I'm sorry, not Stephen, but Philip. He, he moved Philip to a, a desert road down near Gaza, and there he found a, a wealthy Ethiopian in a chariot, and, um, and Philip joined himself to that chariot, and he heard him reading from the Old Testament book of Isaiah, the scroll of Isaiah. And uh, Philip just walked up and said, hey, sir, do you understand what you're reading? And the man said, how can I understand unless somebody shows me? There's a lot of people who are like that today. They need somebody to teach or talk or tell them about it. And the Bible says there in in Acts chapter 8 that that Philip started there and he went straight to Jesus. And I just remind you that wherever you are in your reading I want you to see Jesus everywhere. Dr. Adrian Rogers would say this. He said that, that you'll see him in broad daylight or somewhere near, nearby in the shadows. The whole Bible is about Jesus. Everywhere you look, you'll find uh, the, the beautiful portrayal or the picture of the Lord Jesus. There's a, there's a passage in the closing chapter of Matthew's Gospel um, Matthew chapter 28 that's always fascinated me this connection it's the resurrection story in Matthew and it's also the passage where we find the great commission Matthew 28 one of the one of the places and I just want to remind you of something that that that, um, that I've loved as I've learned this about that connection if you read read about it Matthew chapter 28 early on that Monday uh, that Sunday morning the women went to the to the tomb there had been uh, a miracle that happened. An angel met them there and said, he is not here, he's risen. And the angel said to the women, tell his disciples, tell his brothers to go to Galilee and he will meet them there. 
little bit later as the ladies are leaving the tomb, the garden tomb, uh, none other than the resurrected Lord Jesus meets them there and they worship him. And he says to the ladies, go tell my brethren to meet me in Galilee. I, I, I've thought about that from time to time. What's the, what's the connection, the spiritual connection between the garden tomb of re- resurrection and uh, the great commission there in Galilee? What's the connection there? Here's what I believe it is. I believe that the disciples with all of their confusion and all of their Uh, fears and all of their failures during those moments, they had to come to a place where they fell back in love with Jesus. And the best place on the planet for them to do that was where it all began. It all began in Galilee. That's where the earthly ministry of Jesus happened. Where they first heard his voice, where they first dropped their nets, where they, where, they, where they first said, yes, Jesus, I'll follow you, I'll, I'll serve you. anywhere." They, they first saw the miracles there. Let me ask you this question. Have you ever had a, a moment where you went back to your Galilee, that place where you first fell in love with Jesus, when you really believed, when you really understood what it meant to be a follower of Christ? That's, I think that's what that connection was all about. Uh, not terribly long ago, I was going through a box of old books, and I opened one of them up and I I found a treasure there on the top of that box. It was my boyhood Bible. Bible that I'd gotten the summer that I had uh, come to know Christ as a 12-year-old boy and my mom was so glad that I got saved. She bought me a Bible. My name was on the front of it and and I used that Bible all through my my middle school, high school and into my college years and and I, I, I came across it and there it was with all my little handwritten notes and unremarkable sermons in that little Bible and I, I thought about bringing it but it's pretty fragile now and in that Bible was a handwritten outline of a sermon that I preached when I was 15 years old and it was that night that my father came to know Christ and I pulled that little that little boyhood Bible out of that box and I, I could feel the heat from it, Brother Sam. I, I, st- I remembered what it was like when I really trusted that, that the power was in the Word, that, that, that God's Word is enough. It's all we need. And I, I just want to remind you of that today and one of the things that I've been asking folks to do and, and they're um, embracing God's word and falling back in love with Jesus is to get on our hearts what God has on his heart. And I want to ask you to do something. As a part of our invitation today, among other things, I have brought with me a little card, and I do have permission from your pastor to do this. It's called a Harvest Prayer Reminder Card. It's just this little, pretty much a blank piece of paper a little uh, card stock, a little card. I've got them spread out all over the front of this beautiful sanctuary on the steps. And I want to ask you this question. Here's the question. Who do you know that is near to you but far from God? Somebody's face coming to mind, somebody's name coming to mind, maybe a son or a daughter, a brother, a sister. One of the things that I believe we're... Uh, needing desperately to do in our church culture is is to pray that the Lord of the harvest would send forth labors into the harvest. And I'm asking our churches in West Tennessee to begin to pray hard for lost family members, lost friends. I'm going to ask you in just a moment as we enter into this time of decision, this time of uh, invitation, that if you're you're here today and you say, you know what, I know somebody that's near to me but far from God, and I'm going to commit to pray for them. I'm going to ask you to come down the front. Don't do anything, say anything, just pick up one of these little cards. Nobody's going to want this back. It's for you to write down that person's name or names on the card and then keep it with you. Tuck it in your Bible. Put it in your your place of devotion or prayer, wherever wherever you spend some time with the Lord. Just keep that with you and begin to pray for that that loved one, that, that family member, that friend, that colleague, that coworker, that fellow student. That as far as you know, they're far from the Lord. And so you're going to pray for them. And this would be a great way to begin to, our, our summer together to pray for those that, that, that are uh, in desperate need to come to the beauty of the word of God, for them to hear and to begin to do what God's word says. I'm going to ask you to bow with me right now. And I'm going to ask for our worship team and uh, the staff members who are designated to come down front. I'm going to ask you guys and ladies to come on down. And, and um, as the music begins to play in just a moment, and with your head bowed and your heart open, your head bowed but your heart open, I'm going to ask you, man, wouldn't this be a good day for you to fall fresh in love with God's Word? Fall fresh in love with the reading of it, doing your devotion times. Fall fresh in love with Jesus, spending time with Him, sharing the good news of the gospel with family members and friends. In just a moment, 
I'm going to pray and we're going to stand and begin to sing a song. As you do every week, you're going to have an opportunity to respond. And you may be here today, and you may be one of those who recently at, at a camp or recently at some, in some moment where you prayed and trusted Jesus as Lord and Savior. This might be a great day for you to come and tell one of the staff members down front, I'm making public my decision to follow Christ. It might be that you're here today and your heart's been beating a long time about this, and, and you know that today is your day. And I want to encourage you with your head bowed but your heart open. If you've never trusted Jesus, why don't you make this your prayer right now? Something like this. Lord, I know that I'm not perfect. I'm I'm a person that's far from you. And Lord, I need you today. And Lord, today with all of my heart, I'm trusting Jesus. Come into my life, Lord. Save me. Forgive me. Help me to live for you and love you for the rest of my life. And if that's your prayer today, please come this morning during this invitation time and tell one of these friends down front. You're here today as a guest, a great day, great time here at the beginning of summer to come join Kyreville First Baptist Church. I encourage you to come and let them know if you desire to do that, and they'll help you in that process. But for sure, no, if, if no other decision is, is yours to make, why don't you come? After I pray, come get one of these prayer cards. Write somebody's name down on it, begin to pray for them. You'll do that as well during the invitation. I'm going to pray right now, and we're going to stand and sing. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that it is more than enough. It is far more than adequate to meet our needs. God, thank you that the word tells us how to live, how to love, how to be saved. Thank you, God, that the whole Bible is about Jesus. Help us to fall fresh in love with with the word and fall fresh in love with you. And Lord, for today's decisions, I pray, God, that you would grant the courage and the calmness of spirit for people to come and do business with you. So, Lord, we dedicate these next Uh, these next few few minutes to you. God, have your way during this time of invitation. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together and you come right now while we sing. Come on down right now. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever breathe. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the only one every other day. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you, oh, holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you, open up my eyes in wonder, show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those. Oh, 
Thank you, brother. Thank you, brother Danny. Before we go, I just want to give you a few announcements. Uh, camp Champ, it is a camp for special needs children, kindergarten through eighth grade. It's July 11th through 14th. We still have registration. It's a great opportunity for your special needs child. If you know someone who might be able to take advantage, make sure to pass it on. Our women on mission are trying to feed missionaries, students who have come to Memphis to work with one of our partners at Brinkley, High, Brinkley Heights. They do backyard kids clubs and other ministry projects. And to help our women on mission, they need you to bring some snacks. So next time go buy some Little Debbie's, some uh, potato chips, do something different, don't eat them. Bring them here to the church by July 6th, okay? And we'll give them to the students. And a few weeks ago, we encouraged you about a step that you could take to be pro-life is to support Life Choices, one of our partners. You may have gotten a bottle, you may have brought it back, but some of you may not have. I know what it's like to forget. So please bring those back uh, by next Sunday, okay? So that we can give it over to Life Choices because just like the church, their work continues. Uh, we have still things to do to tell people that they're, they're important, that all people are important. So as we go, be blessed. Let me pray for you. Father, we come right now and we thank you for this word. Lord, we thank you that you have given us the word. Lord, I pray for your people as they go this week. I pray for myself that we won't be so busy that we won't spend time with you in your word because your word is truth. Your word, provi your word provides direction, encouragement, life. Lord, so help us this week be in your word. Renew us through it. Renew our love for it so that we might be used for you, for your glory, that we might bless others by sharing about what this word says, that we all need Jesus, that he's the way, the truth, and the life, that no man goes to the Father but by him. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Be blessed.